Okay, we're back in session. So, um, Todd, did you say there are yeah, people waiting? Yeah, we wanted to jump to the um, the monitoring report on okay. which I lost. I can see. Um, Community involvement. Yeah. Um, so you have your monitoring report for community involvement, but as we as sorry, you have to dig dig through. It is the second to about fourth to last document. Um, it's the the one that covers all of the partnerships we have. And as you recall, we had this discussion last year. We have this impressive list of um, partnerships. Um, and we have some good input from the board about well, what's the impact on that. Um, and a specific request was let's have a couple of those partners tell us what the impact is. So um, today we've chosen a couple of those to highlight. Um, today we have um, uh, Crystal Sully from the Sheets uh, County Public Health to talk about one of the major partnerships we had this year, which was our vaccination plan. Um, so, Crystal, I'm going to hand it over to you and, and have you give us an idea of what, what that's all like. Sure. Thanks uh, so much. And thanks for having me uh, to speak a little bit about the work that we've been able to do in, in partnership and collaboration. Uh, my name is Crystal Sully. I work in the COVID response and recovery unit within public health at Deschutes County. Uh, my role is that I supervise all clinical delivery services. So that's uh, related to COVID. Uh, so that would be testing uh, COVID infection therapeutics and of course vaccination, which we're gonna talk a little bit about. Um, we started our partnership with Deschutes County Library at the downtown Bend site, um, actually before I came on in this role at the county. And I came on about July of last year in this role. And so just wanted to kind of provide some of the data that um, I know that my team has directly been able to perform within um, the space that the libraries have provided for us. Um, so that that main relationship started, uh, you know, right after the mass vaccination clinic closed uh, in Redmond. And we went to this more distributed model of having vaccine available in the community at pharmacies uh, with primary care offices and through Deschutes County Public Health. Uh, we've really been grateful for the library's partnership. It's allowed us to connect with the community in a really meaningful way. Um, you know, we're, we are government, we're seen as government. Uh, but in, you know, operating out of, of the house of the library, we're able to just connect with people in a different way uh, and be there on a reliable basis so that people can come and ask questions. We uh, give out testing supplies at all of our clinics. Uh, we talk to people about therapeutics. So you can come to a vaccination clinic and not necessarily walk away with a vaccination that happens I would say pretty much every clinic that we have. Uh, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to provide education. Uh, we're here to provide non-biased information and be here uh, ready to vaccinate the community whenever they're ready. So I'll click to this next one. This is this is this, you know, kind of exciting slide, I think. Uh, when I looked back and looked at the last 12 months of, uh, of data at the downtown Bend Library, which is, I would say, our most consistent standing clinic uh, in terms of date, time, and longevity, um, we've been able to deliver over 6,000 doses of, of COVID vaccine in the community. And that's just a tremendous amount of vaccine. I think anybody who's been at the Bend Library when one of these clinics has gone on especially during our busy booster times, has seen the people waiting, has seen the process. Um, if you haven't seen the process and you're interested, I would encourage anyone to stop by. 
uh, last September after a long summer of doing vaccine clinics in the parking lot outside of the Lapine Chamber building. Mm -hmm. uh, Lapine Library kindly uh, let us have some space and time to do vaccination like we were doing at the Bend Downtown Library. And thus far, we've delivered 1,694 doses of, of COVID vaccine in that community at the library. And again, it just fosters that relationship um, and that knowledge that we're public health. And, you know, we, we get questions about everything from COVID to recently monkeypox. So uh, having that presence in the community and the partnership with the library has just been tremendous for us. Uh, the Sisters Library has also jumped in and, and joined for some clinics, uh, especially throughout this summer. But just in uh, using that space as an alternate site, we've delivered 378 doses in that community. Uh, so it's just been a tremendous impact and uh, a steady partnership that we really, really appreciate. Uh, and just a little shout out to my teams who are there day in and day out. Uh, this is a picture from inside the Ben Library uh, a few months ago. <laughs> Obviously, we got the, the winter hats on. Um, you know, what's the big deal? What goes into giving a dose of vaccine? And there's so much that goes into giving a dose of these vaccines, partly because of information, misinformation. We do a lot of education at our, uh, at our vaccine events. We try to do it when people are waiting in line. We try to make that efficient. Um, but just, you know, all those things that go into giving a vaccine, we couldn't do it without the space and without the kindness of um, the library process. I'm happy to answer any questions. I wasn't sure exactly what you would want to hear. Uh, so I'm, I'm open to, to whatever you guys want to know about. Yeah, I just, I want to say thank you to you and all of your staff for the work that you do. Uh, it's been a tremendous partnership and, and anybody who's been in any of the libraries while the clinics are going on, I mean, it's, it's amazing and your process is so efficient, just like at the fairgrounds and I, and I think it's a wonderful partnership. I agree. The value having you as a partner. You've done tremendous work during this last two and a half years. Thank you. And, and we couldn't do it without you and, and everyone including our volunteers who about 65 to 75% of the staff that you see uh, when we have a clinic running are our public health volunteer core uh, folks. So they're there um, volunteering their time and it's just incredible. Thank you very, very much. This is, this is great. Uh, this is terrific because your elephant in the room combating this information that's really turning out to be the main hesitancy about getting vaccinated throughout the country. I can't think of a better location for the people who trust the library for unbiased, truthful information. And it's a non, non combative location. Exactly. It's a government agency, but we're seeing them as a public agency. Now, if you're a public agency, perhaps in this way, we can both. Enhance each other's the, the public concept of what public health really is all about. Yeah, I think I caught most of that. You cut in and out just a little bit, but um, you know, certainly the the trust that the library has garnered over many many years in this community. Um, you know, we've really been able to piggyback on that and to be consistent about being present. Uh, so that when the community sees that we're we're here in times of high demand and we're here in times when maybe the demand is lower, but the need for education is higher. Uh, and so we're just going to keep showing up. Yeah. Okay. And not to put you on the spot, but what do you think if this, if the pandemic has become endemic, how can we further interact with public health? 
in the future? I think that actually vaccination overall is a really great opportunity for us uh, to partner together. I think sometimes, um, you know, all the things that happen in public health, uh, the prevention pieces of public health, a lot of the public uh, that we're here to serve has no idea about services that are offered. So uh, we also have at all of our uh, standing clinics, we have interpreters who are trained on kind of all of the offerings of public health and behavioral health. So that's another way that we've been able to really plug people into services that already exist uh, that they didn't even know were present. So I think just making sure that the relationship uh, stays consistent uh, and that the public sees the partnership and that safety and trust, I think those are the biggest things. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time out to be with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, and I look forward to maybe coming back next year and, and giving you an update again. That'd be great. Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you. Okay, then uh, another program we want to highlight. Uh, we have Captain Jasper here, our library services supervisor. Um, yeah, and I can tell you, I can already tell you one more way that we can partner with the county health department because we're already doing it and you'll hear about it in just a second, um, which is great. So um, I just wanted to start off, you know, we've all been doing summer with the library, Veronica and the Biblioteca for as long as any of us can remember. And um, there's some evolving parts of the program that are really exciting that really get us into that community involvement. So I just wanted to highlight some of the ways that that is growing and how we are developing that. Um, so we can keep, yep, keep going. This is in the next picture. Thank you, Robert. I can go one more. Um, this is just the, we've, we've been doing some with the library in the building forever and it's great. People come in, they sign up, they get prizes, they hopefully get excited about reading, they get some interesting programs. And we've always really believed in what that does for families and for children. Um, this is really just a way to try to expand it outside of the borders. So if on the next slide, we'll just see a library on the go. This is a program that um, started actually a couple of staff members who aren't with us anymore, kind of got us going down this road. Um, and then we really built on it in the last couple of years in a more comprehensive way. Um, you probably have heard about this before. Um, it has a lot to do with the community engagement model that we're trying to embrace and, and this effort to get out to communities on their terms is a little bit better. This year, these are just some quick facts for this year. We're going to 11 sites. All of them are low income neighborhoods. They range from either housing work sites or mobile home parks or uh, apartment complexes. Um, about a little over half of them have really high Spanish speaking populations. Um, and what we are doing, our staff this year is at, we are doing one event at each of these sites, but each one has a lead, and our staff member is going two to three times in advance to say hello to the residents, to stand by the mailbox and hand out flyers, to talk to the property manager, just to kind of get to know the neighborhood a little bit more before we just show up and, and start doing things. Um, so why are we talking about this with community involvement? What's really developed and has been so exciting is the number of community partners that have decided to join us and offer information, offer activities and engage with the community. All of the ones listed here are organizations that are there with us, maybe not every time, but in some combination. So the Seed to Table is a, a, a farm nonprofit out of Sisters and they are there giving away vegetables. Um, COIC, you know, that was an exciting one. They reached out to us and said, we're trying to get um, engagement on our survey for a hub, a transportation hub. Can we show up and talk to people? And we're like, yeah, we're going to be here. Here's our calendar. Here's our date. People come talk to people. Um, the high school equivalency program, which is geared largely towards adults, that was another one that they just heard that we were doing this. They contacted us and said, we'd love to be out there with you and we can sign up for all your available dates. So it's been just a really great combination of we sort of created this infrastructure and we got to know some of the partners and then they share and they reach out and we um, we just have really built up a little group of people that are all there together. 
Um, on my next slide, I have what every good PowerPoint should have, which is a spreadsheet, because I know how exciting they are. Um, but this is just one of the things that was exciting about this year is we literally created this calendar. These are our locations. And we took the scary jump of doing a Google Doc and inviting everybody to sign up themselves. Um, we had a few mishaps along the way with whatever. I, the only reason I included this was we really opened this up to our partners. They came here, they picked their dates, they picked their spot, and, and they're going for it. So what I like is that the library can create the infrastructure and back off a little, and it's the partners that are are doing some of the organizing and the thinking themselves, which is just makes it more sustainable and it makes it more cooperative and it, it just is better. Um, this is just a couple of fun pictures as far as what the library itself is actually doing um, at these. It's all things that you're pretty uh, pretty familiar with. Um, this year's fun, we are trying to have a performer at every site. So we've had um, the West African drummer, we have had uh, a Mexican traditional dance troupe, we've had some classical guitar, we've had some fiddle playing, um, and it really brings a very festive atmosphere to the, to the experiences. We wanted it to feel, we really wanted to create experiences in these neighborhoods that felt like a celebration. Um, so that, we didn't know how it was gonna go so far so good. We've only had three so far. Um, and again, I think I just have more cute pictures. If you keep going, they're, they're not the, um, and we've only had three visits so far. So far we've, in those three visits, we've signed 99 people up with a book and a reading log and on off they go. Um, and we've had interactions with 140 people. But we're like, I said, we're only three out of the 11 sites in. Um, and that's it, but I just wanted to share the ways that we're sort of building on that community engagement. Oh, and this was just my slide to say, like everything we do, I just always want to remember how much of a group effort it is. So I'm here talking about what this has felt like from the library services point of view, but um, technical services, e-services, CR, volunteers, so, and all these people help make this happen. So I just always want to be mindful of that. And those are some of our happy prize winners from last year. Um, we give away tablets, um, Amazon gift cards, books, and puppets. It's pretty fun. So that's it. Do you have any questions or? It is your schedule on the website. It is. If you click on Summer with the Library, okay. um, the, you know, it's featured now. Okay. And if you just have to scroll all the way to the bottom. Okay. And one, you know, it, it intentional thing is only one of them is in a public park. Everything else is in a mobile home community. Or so the one in Kalanis Park we tried to put there because it is surrounded by several low-income apartment housing complexes. Um, and that's the only one that made it into our actual events guide. So you're on the right track and then if you really want to know where they are, you actually have to go to the website and not the event guide. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tennis sites. Where, how many were outside? I recognize some of those streets, but how many were outside the tennis? We did, we have one in Lapine, three in Redmond, and then seven in Redmond. When you're at the site, how many hours is it? Two hours. Yeah, we're doing six to eight on Wednesdays or 10 to 12 on Saturdays. So you're trying to move it to the edges of the day and see if we can let the temperatures cool off a little. Um, last year we did four to six. That's the time. 33 people for 12. Yeah, and, and the level of engagement is really good. I mean, we're really talking to families, we're talking to parents, we're talking to whole communities. Um, I've only been at one of the three. It was at Country Sunset Mobile Home Park, which is on 27. Well, actually, it's right across the street from. And, um, yeah. you know, it was the whole community. I mean, it was people playing volleyball, people playing. I mean, it was just like, it was such a wonderful community event. We had the partners there, uh, the Chiefs County Health was there. They were sharing so much information about everything. Yeah, I mean, it just is a great, fun place to get information and fun now. Great to see uh, when Chuck Redmond and the addresses. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, it seems like you really thought the whole thing through really carefully in the advance work, and that's what's making it so successful. I mean, it harkens back to your earlier presentation about staff creativity and the engagement 
and brainstorming how to do things like this. And it's just like to see the thought that went into it was really impressive. And you get the results. Of it. Yeah. And also, you know, a shout out to the partners who actually, after last summer, we had two meetings where we could share our feedback on that on last summer. Right. What time, you know, all like what locations, what times, or whatever. And so, I mean, at that partner meeting, I think we had like 15 partners represented, mm -hmm. um, and all of them giving their input on what they would like to see next year. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this is perfect. I mean, it's really great work. Thank you. When all come together, it's so much fun. So, yeah, yeah, no, it's, yeah. No. It's great. The then the next school Spanish speaking individual, and your partners have. Well, I'm so glad you said that. That was one of the things I meant to say on the slide. Um, so, we, you know, we still don't actually have a Spanish speaker on our team. We are still, you know, we're recruiting right now. So hopefully someone will come on. We have an interpreter at every um, visit. And we actually, for those librarians that are doing their pre-visits, you know, we encourage them to bring an interpreter along with that if they need to. But what has been cooler than that is before we do the pre-visit, we send out a message to um, all of our partners and say, hey, if you want to join us, join us. So I'm going to be, I'm going to leave for the St. Thomas in Redmond, the St. Thomas Church. We're going to go, there's a Spanish language mass. We're just going to be available right after the Spanish language mass. So I was going to ask for an interpreter, but when I sent out to my partners, um, Jessica from the OS Recursos program, who's fluent in Spanish, was like, I'll join you. And so now it's going to be Jessica and I instead of us having an interpreter, which is, and it's a great connection time for us. Every, almost everyone I know has done a pre-visit with a partner. So then we build up that relationship, which is really great too. It really makes the partnership. It does. Benefits both. You're showing up together. You're looking at the property together. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, no, it's like you're getting this all charged down here. This is like awesome. That was a lot of numbers for a lot of the conversations before. As I was sitting there, I was getting photographs. Well, you have, yeah, yeah, yeah. photographs are like the happiest photographs that we've seen for a long time. Yeah, it's just so. Um, I will be back to you if you want to go over the monitoring report right now, or we can. Go finish this up and get to the that part of the presentation. Why don't we just do the monitoring the executive limitations thing now? If that's right. okay with you. One last question for you. Okay. Yeah. Why is that as a budget for? You continue with your programs. How are your financial resources? I feel like our I feel like our materials budget and, and that is really robust. Um, what's nice about this is we have our library budget, which is, is great. Um, we also, because it focuses on the kiddos, can use the other ready to read grant. Um, so a lot of that can potentially feed into some of it, but we really don't even need that that much. Um, we are definitely not limited at this point um, at all by money. You're not going to say this sometimes. I'm not, no. Um, Spanish speaker, that was, I would say no. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of thing more that is probably going to miss even that, that connection. But... So, what seems to be our main problem for recruiting Spanish speaking? I know, that's such a good question. It's probably not one that maybe fits in. I don't know. I... It's, a, it's a huge question. It's a problem across the right. state. <laughs> Um, it's a challenge also right now. It's a challenge hiring people in general. Um, not that really finding people that fit what we're looking for and actually are out there and available. It's just difficult. I think we have, we have been tracking other libraries around the state are having the exact same problem. So the reason there's a shortage of training is qualified person companies. So I'm it's not just it's not, not just, just libraries in every public agency. Yeah, also yeah. the county. Um, but you're not finding that if there's a qualified individual, they don't have to be possible in here. We have on that. Yeah, the last the, the, the last one that we did, we had one that I I really really wanted to hear, and um, you know our HR department. 
did everything they could to support the endeavor in terms of trying to connect her with housing and child. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really yeah. worked hard and just could not quite make these numbers work. You're right, funny to have you with the Okay. Do people have any questions and thoughts about the monitoring reporting in general? I, I, I just want to say one great input last year, obviously, uh, to put what kind of a story to unite this long, bolded list. Mm -hmm. uh, because for each one of these, there's a story. Yeah. And, and I think that really gets to more than being listening. Uh, Hundred different places we go to, uh, you're seeing what that impact is, and um, and I think that gets to the heart of what the board is trying to do. Right. So that's what I say, Bob. Uh, Excellent. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Other other than photo bombing, picture last year at an event. This is everybody else. <laughs> okay. Well, I would entertain a motion to bring the plan to the policy. I will so move. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? Just in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank Great. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I can be here. Okay, so um, I think we have lunch, and then uh, if we want to just continue, I'll call, call a brief recess so we can grab something to eat, and if you want to just continue to work, and is that good? Okay, all right, let's uh, go get the food, I'll call a brief recess, and come back. Of uh, us acting as the Deschutes Public Library District Board and the local contract review board, we will be discussing public contract reports. The pur purpose of this public hearing is to take comments from the district's draft findings supporting the exemption of certain classes of special procurements and public exclusive contracts from competitive bidding requirements. Um, if you would like to open the meeting for public comments, uh, we, the limit for this is 20 minutes total, and each person will have three minutes um, to make their comments. Is there Are there any members of the public who would like to comment on the draft findings? We, we do not have budget. Like Okay. In that, I will close the public hearing comment comment period for this uh, hearing, and we will be considering resolution eleven adoption of public contract conditions, the sole sort of contract with backstage library. Um, so I'm we're we're going to put Robert on the spot, and, and we have. Uh, as soon as we get some technology. Okay. There, there we go. Okay, thanks for bearing with me. We will move back up there. All right. Um, the, the, the memorandum that, that I provided to you, I uh, kind of walked you through the basics of it, but essentially what we're looking at here is related to technical services, overall project for reclassification, something that, that Emily has, has uh, presented to the board of, uh, several times at this point to step you through why we're doing it and what's involved. The memo gives you a little bit of a, a sense of the scale 
we're looking at something on the order of about 240,000 collection materials that need to be handled, uh, both physically and on the back end with, uh, with metadata. Uh, application of RFID tags, uh, spine labels, ultimately sorting and reshelving, although that's uh, later phases in the, in the overall work. So uh, we've been working with Backstage as our, our, uh, our primary vendor for uh, our ongoing authority, authority control, that term. Uh, and so we had two options that Emily explored and that was to look at whether we could do this in-house entirely, which was something that, that DPL did for the children's collection, but at a much smaller scale than we're talking about here. Or to go out and, and find a vendor that had the capability of doing it and could do it to our satisfaction and our specification with this custom classification system. So we did all of that, that investigation determined that if possible, we wanted to go with a vendor, did the vendor search and really only found one qualified vendor that's backstage uh, based on their performance of what they've, they've done for us in the past and discussions with them as part of the market research to determine their capabilities of doing uh, what we're asking for, for for supporting a reclassification. They actually have experience doing work similar to this uh, at other libraries so that that increased our level of confidence that they could deliver what we're looking for. Um, and so, so after going through that process, uh, we, we determined that uh, rather than going through the formal RFP and go out there into the, into the marketplace uh, and to do even more market research, uh, we, we had already identified the, uh, a low risk solution that would also help us stick to the, the timeline that we need, because obviously we want to be able to turn this around quickly enough so that by the time we are reopening, Sisters, the Pine, and, uh, and and ultimately Sun River, and and, and the rest of the, the areas that we're looking for development. Uh, as we do that, we want these new locations to reopen and have the, the fully reclassified system in place. So, believe it or not, that is a very aggressive timeline for some of those early branches to get that in place. Uh, and so, so both for, for project risk and for for uh, in, increasing our chances of being able to hit that that schedule backstage seems to us to be uh, a prime candidate for uh, designating it as a sole source provider for this rather than pursuing the, the purchasing rule that, that dictates a, an RFP and a formal process. Uh, we did go through the process of, uh, of issuing a uh, public notice for seven days uh, at the beginning of July. And so it, 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 uh, it just completed earlier this week. And uh, we don't have any public comments. That that was the invitation in the, in the public notice was to for any other potential vendors who saw this and wanted to raise their hand and say we we feel that we should be offered some consideration to come to this meeting. Uh, so we went through the process dictated through through our, um, our legal counsel and and, and you know, our board policies. And at this point, we are looking for for a uh, a, a move from the board a motion from the board to authorize resolution number 11. That resolution, which was in the packet, does step through the full set of details on the reasoning and, and, the, and the work that went into analyzing the, the, the determination for the backstage to provide that service. And then at this point, I'll just put another question. So where did you... In the bulletin, uh, yeah, it's very similar to the process that we've done for other uh, special procurements, things uh, like what what uh, uh, this case mixes has done on our behalf for, for some of the construction projects. What we also did uh, last month for the the uh, Baker and Taylor for the, the opening day collection, uh, and I think we did it also for B Tech recently. Uh, the, the bulletin serving as the as the publication director for the So you're doing a bit of a something like that. No, in consultation with with legal counsel, uh, and the determination was was what one one publication of record would be insufficient. Any other questions? Just a comment that if you're looking at motions, Robert's motion is more complete than mine. Oh, 
maybe is it that in the in the bottom of the memo? Yeah. Yeah. It is a two year contract that we're looking to pursue. So it would run this fiscal year and next fiscal year. Now, just for the purposes of uh, tying this up with budget, the board has approved a budget and adopted the budget just for this fiscal year. So the, the full scope that's outlined in that resolution is a projected uh, contract ceiling that encompasses what we could choose to execute for both phases of the work being done. But right now, we provision just for this fiscal year at, at an amount that is approved by the board of 250000 as part of our budget. So you're So does it show what you do? Because I missed the Thursdays. It's in the contract, but not in the resolution, which is which is typical of the resolution language. The resolution is is authorizing a um, uh, an exemption to the the purchasing rule for for designation of a special procurement. I, I can provide the, the the full text of the contract as the background. As long as it's in the contract, it's it, time to it is absolutely yeah yeah. It, and so the contract period performance begins from from date of signature and and concludes. Uh, June 30th, 2024, which carries us to the completion of the following fiscal year. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She authorized resolution 11, the exemption to purchase of uh, electrical plastic safety services from public contracting requirements and approving a contract specific special procurement and sole source. Under District Code 137 And just to point out, this is resolution number five. We will. I'm sorry, did I lose track of the number of systems? No, I forgot to put a number on it. I put it out. I didn't write that. Yes. Okay, so uh, this is authorized by signers for the coming year. Questions about this resolution? And as you see, uh, you can't see because it's tiny, but um, I, I was during our break, I told them we now do an hour officers. It's no questions. I will wait for the motion. Also moved. So this past month, you know, relative to our project schedule, 
we went through, really looked at our master development schedule, updated it um, to really capture what we were doing with the land purchase on Central Library with the execution of the LOI and have reissued that. Uh, so we use our master development schedule to communicate with all our design team members, contractors, everybody. And so that's been brought up current, not just for Central, but it adjusts for what we're doing with downtown Bend. That's how it adjusts. Um, Redmond is generally consistent. Some minor just updates in sequence with uh, Kirby Nagel House estimated construction schedule and how we're keeping some that work. Sisters in Lapine stayed very consistent. No real changes there. Sun River, we had updated based on when we released them to commence the schematic design and worked through a design schedule with Miller Hall. Got that all documented and put in there and that lays out our plan for uh, that project. The only project that isn't fully updated, of course, is East Bend. It's on hold. It tracks concurrent with Sun River on our forms, even though it's on hold. At some point, we will modify that. As we update our master development schedule, we use that. So like I used it with Miller Hall and evaluating our the work ahead of us in developing their proposal. I share it with our CMGCs to make sure that they're comfortable that our dates, durations, and strategies are still sound. Uh, nothing significant has changed. As I updated that, I updated our summary schedule, which I attached to your board report. And that's the one page um, Excel spreadsheet kind of for. I'll say one page, yes. Uh, so that's updated now, current. I hadn't updated that in the past few months, but that shows the projection for Central of when. So earlier you had asked me about when would Central be done? That's driven out of our schedules. But so as you guys look at that, that is a current level. I also updated the table in my report uh, that has key dates in it uh, of when we'd start construction, when we had end and open. And so all of those are updated. They're all current. Uh, again, with the one being East Bend, still not uh, fully defined. So big picture in with Central Library, it's about a year off of where we were with the Robo site in opening. So almost, I want to say almost like to the date, but very close. Uh, so we were going to open October of 24, we're October of 25. Downtown Bend follows as it always has. So it's pushed out into 26. Redmond is still on track to uh, open um, in 24 in August, late July, early August. So that's on track. Schedule wise, Redmond, Sisters, and Lapine were scheduled to start closing those facilities in the beginning of the year, so in January, opening up temporary facilities uh, in those locations. And we'll talk more about that. And then same with uh, and Redmond. So three of them are all in that time frame, and that's still consistent. Um, the dates that I put in the table, they're just in case there's any questions on them, tie back to our master development schedule. So you'll see that I have inserted those. The central library start date of construction is October 2nd. That's currently kind of the outside date that we see. We could potentially move up a little bit, um, just depending on how we go through due diligence, assuming we move out due diligence into um, actual closing on the purchase and execution of design and permitting. But I 
tried to take a little bit more conservative approach on that. I don't think it'd be a big shift, but potentially a, you know, like a month or so. So that's where we're at on the schedule. On the budget, attached is the budget summary. And that captures, you know, all of the uh, costs pay to date through May. There weren't major changes in any commitments. Uh, you know, even our last funding was much lower just because we had slowed down so much of the work. The amount that we were spending went down. So not too much change there. The one thing I, I did want to talk about in the end uh, I wanted to point out on page one of the cost report, we were talking about the branches and what we're doing with the branches. And if you look down there near the bottom, the subtotal for Sun River Sisters, the Pine and East Bend, in our original budget, which was the cost estimate generated as part of the bond program, uh, to determine the 195 million. At that point, we were planning a $6.7 million budget for those branches. We are currently, we've revised that budget and we're just under 15 million. So we've actually increased it uh, substantially. It's actually up 122% over what it was. And that was driven off of what we heard from you guys, from all of you about the importance of the branches, that we make sure that we're dealing with all the issues. So, you know, early on, one of the very first things we did was with our design team was a facilities evaluation of all the facilities. We took the information that had been studied early on because there were some early on good facility assessment of the condition of electrical systems, mechanical systems, the building, we went back out with our design team and reevaluated all those buildings and looked at them and said, okay, what's working? We talked with operations with Robert and his team, with the vendors who maintained like our mechanical system and stuff, and said, what's working? What's not? What's its condition? And uh, to really develop, hey, what's the right thing to do for these branches to make sure that we would allocating funds. And as you know, when we sold the bonds, there were premiums that were earned, right? Which brought our budget from the 195 million up to 224 million. So when we allocated those premiums out, a big chunk went to the branches. And I wanted to just point it out and uh, that way we could have any discussion that we're truly looking at. And that's also when we, initially said, hey, we want to make sure East Bend was being treated fairly because as you see in the original cost estimate done, uh, there's very little, almost no money in for East Bend. It wasn't segregated. And so we then said, okay, what is that? And we built that into the budget. So those dollars are there uh, just to help see what we're doing financially with them. Within these budgets, is that each month as I evaluate project costs for the entire bond, I look at how are our cost estimates coming in, the construction costs coming in, cost estimator from our CMGC. What's our cost estimates doing for our FFME and all of the owner furnished items? And where are they? Because we get regular updates from our purchasing group and uh, Miller Hall on where those are going. And I look at all of that. And if you compare it back, you can see adjustments within the budget, it didn't change the budget, but reallocating between hard cost, soft cost, FFE. And that's just how I look at it every month. And it's like, okay, I'm going to adjust this and adjust that. The one that adjusted the most, of course, was Central. And so with Central, you can see the site and due diligence cost uh, is up. If you did a comparison back to the last month, you would see it's gone up, of course, for the land purchase, because I forecasted that in there. 
I also went and looked at what is what do I expect soft costs to be for the Miller Hall, their design fees, and what about all of our construction costs? I looked at all of that. And so I could build it in there and look at it. And you can see that currently we have 82 million in our hard cost line item, and that's our current budget. And this is under central on page one. That's the budget for the construction cost of the central line. And so I, I look at that so that one, we can balance the budget, identify what funds we have build our building with, and then communicate that out to our team. So I discussed this with Kirby Nagelhauer, CMGC, and talk about here's what our budget is gonna be and what's our cost on that. Same with Miller Hall. So this is something I try to do every month is look at where we at, always verify. And so I've forecasted in all the cost impacts relative to Central with the new land purchase, all the design fees, the time impact fees, everything's in my forecast. I will tell you guys this is my estimate of where we're going to be. I'm confident in it, that it's achievable. And like we talked about with math and yourselves, as we move into the next phases, we will be designing to this budget for our construction costs. And um, it's a process uh, that we use. We've used it with the other buildings, just as we will with this, uh, making sure that in the end, we can still achieve our goals of what we want to deliver and the budget we have to spend. One of the things I've tried to do is maintain a level of owner's contingency throughout. Uh, there's been no change in that contingency level. Um, I have looked at every way. I have lots of little cap cost categories that I look at and say, okay, how do we manage our budget and protect our contingency? The contingency is for those unforeseen that will happen in the future as we get into construction. They come up much more frequently. Um, so I'm happy to say that all of our owner contingencies are sound. They, they remain there. Built into our construction budgets are contingencies as well for development of the design. It's a design contingency. So that as the architect draws something that maybe the art contractor didn't fully understand, now once he sees it, it's like, oh, now I, here's the price. <laughs> uh, it's there to help us let the design develop and put that away. Also within those construction budgets is cost escalation for the impacts of inflation and the, what's the cost gonna be in two years, three years out, you know? So we forecast that in, and so those are built in. So I do believe that <clears throat> The overall budget is still very sound to meet those requirements. Uh, and then we have contingencies in place in multiple levels for escalation, for design development, and then for the unforeseen conditions that are bound to happen. So that's where the budget sits. I don't think there's any other significant items to point out. Um, as far as Going up through toward our uh, entitlements. Or excuse me, I skipped over it. Uh, procurements. So I do have two separate summaries that we'll go through afterwards. One is for a fire sprinkler subcontractor on Redmond, and one is for the uh, temporary trailer complex that we'll use for sisters. And so I'll go through those separately. The only other major uh, procurement was what we already talked about with was Miller Hall's contract or central that identity. The uh, entitlements, as you know, we at the last meeting on the 29th, we authorized the execution of the yellow white for the Stevens Ranch property that was executed, issued to the uh, seller. 
our legal counsel, Carrie Holland, um, drafted a purchase sale agreement for us based on that LOI that was then issued to the seller and received their comments. Those comments came back. They've been reviewed by our team, including Carrie, all of us, and are now in a final draft going back to the seller uh, today on the PSA. And it's very consistent, no changes relative to what was in the LOI to what's in the PSA. And so that will be executed. And once that is executed, that establishes the effective date, which starts our due diligence period. Um, so I see that we likely will have that wrapped up this week, and which is in alignment with our schedule. Is that we anticipate? Is a purchase sale agreement. And so we go through. So that outlines in more detail than the LOI purchase of the property. We still have our due diligence period to evaluate and determine if we want to move forward and if we want our down payments to be non-refundable. And then we have basically it's about a year to get to closing. The seller has a goal to deliver and close by next June. But by for the LOI and the PSA has up to uh, the end of September, which again is in uh, agreement with our master development schedule. We don't show that we would even start any work until October. So mm -hmm. um, from that standpoint, they are in alignment with each of those. Um, so that's moving forward well. I can tell you the <laughs> seller actually has spoke to the city about their process, uh, what they need to do to be able to deliver us a final, to close on the land, deliver the land in, with a plat uh, for it, a legal document describing the land that we're buying and approved by the city. He's very encouraged based on his discussions that um, he will most likely exceed our expectations and be able to deliver much of it. Once we signed the LOI, he commenced right away with uh, all of his engineering and doing his thing on his side. Uh, he was competent and said that, you know, the support of the board and the approval of that just made him feel like, okay, I can go. And so he's advancing right along. Um, so that's kind of where that stands at the moment. You know, our next steps would be to engage Miller Hall and commence all of our due diligence. We will be engaging our soils engineer to do studies of the property that we need to do, uh, as well as outreach to other ones. We had discussions at the meeting on the 29th about uh, the piece of property that we're buying. So we first made an offer for 8.1 acres and the property developed, came back, said, no, all or nothing, it's 9.3. So we bought the 9.3 acres. And we wanted to know what can we do with that property? And so we've spoken to uh, bond council as well as DPL's council and uh, told them, look, we're buying this much land, if we don't, use it all if we decide hey we don't need to use all of it what can we do with that one and uh, bond council did confirm that we're allowed to dispose of the land if we want as far as selling it uh, if we sell it any proceeds from that sale has to be used for the bond program so it can't go back into and i may say so, the general fund right uh, for the library, so, but we are allowed under the bond and under those. And uh, Carrie, who's the DPL's counsel, gave us the same advice, but referred us to bond counsel, uh, which was appropriate. So I think we're in a good position there that if we don't need it and we choose to do something with it, it is allowed uh, for the district to do that. So, you know, our first 
action is to figure out with Miller Hall is what do we need? How do we want to use the property? Um, and so we've told them this is what we're buying. Tell us what we want to do. And this is very similar to what we did on Robo. Um, there was actually a little piece of land that Robo that we weren't developing because they said, okay, we don't need to use every square foot and we'll figure that out. The Redmond site, I think I mentioned in our last meeting, uh, we've gotten our approval, but that uh, appeal period expired. And so all of our Redmond entitlement approvals are fully approved and done. So that's actually completed. I'll actually be dropping that off in the report this next month. Design wise, as we said, central, there's not been anything new uh, commenced. Redmond is uh, just marching along at full speed. Uh, we received what we get is a 50% construction document set, and it allows us to do a budget update and a review of the documents. It's kind of ideally our last point where we'll say, can we modify this? Can we move this before we finalize the same style? And so that occurred this month. We're going through the budget exercise now and the review period now, but it's tracking on to be submitted in September into formal funding check. Um, so no significant changes, just really refinement. And at this stage, we're really refining the technical details in the design, of how we're going to build it. So this is that point where our general contractor Kirby is really putting a lot of input into the architect. How's this going to fit? How's that going to go? And they're looking at to make sure they can build the building as cost effectively as possible. The sisters in Lapine also had their 50% CD sets issued to us. We've reviewed those and we're budgeting them now. They moved much quicker. They're going to go into a uh, plan check here in uh, by August. We'll go in for permitting on those documents just because they're smaller, they're faster. Uh, but again, they're sound, they're moving through, no real significant issues have come up, um, no changes to the design. So that's, you know, moving right along. Sun River, we've released them into schematic design. That's proceeding. We get our schematic design plans this month. And so we'll look at that. Again, updating budget, verifying the schedule, and really going through a good scope review with DPL and the staff. Did we get everything? Did they get everything just right? Uh, and they, the design team will let us know what questions they have. One of the things we're going to really evaluate is how we will look at temperate facilities for some reason. What is it? Will it work? Can we do it? What's that cost and impact? And so that'll all be part of a study that will go on from here mid, late July into early August. Update you there. Uh, of course, no work going on with downtown Bend with these things. It's really kind of it where we sit on the project right now. I don't know if there's any particular questions on the report or my comments? Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Um, so if we decide that the bakery, if we decide to go with the property line, so if the inside the acre is too great, can we choose to sell a portion? Are there any restrictions placed on us by the Grand City Council or the government on that? Now, as long as we don't change its use, it, we are free to sell it. Uh, and it's so, more, we just have to follow the particular guidelines that uh, Bond Council, which is not complicated. We did, uh, the seller also agreed because we said we don't know what we're going to do with this, but we want you to stub utilities. In the, onto that site at this cost, so that if we choose to sell, they will be able to tap into the sewer and the water and the power. So, which is value to us? That makes our land more valuable. 
And we also told them that we would want them to put a curb cut for a driveway. Now, as we go through our design process, if we determine that we don't need that curb cut uh, because we're going to use the land, then we'll tell them not to. Uh, I think that they will be advancing pretty fast on their utility design that's in the street that feeds our sites. We will always have those utility studs uh, provided, which, like I said, that's always valuable uh, for the property to have. And then you said that if we sell the property because we purchase the property with bond money, that money would automatically go back into the bond. And so we can use it with the, with the branches or something. Yeah, those funds would basically need to be used within the bond as a whole. It doesn't necessarily have to be the central library. It is the way I read for the moment. Now, I would go back and get another clarification from her if we uh and i say appropriate but uh from them if we went down that path to know very explicitly here's what we can do with the money and just because we think we can find so yeah the box. yeah and whatever we do we i tend to track so there's like traceability this happened now this happened so i always like to know the path because someone may ask me in two years, and it's like, well, I don't remember, but I can go back and look it up. Great, I have a question. Yes. I do with visions, which I appreciate a lot. Um, and I know it's. Um, I just, in the revision for the dam coming in, does that. Is that revision um, capture the delay in that work so the increase in construction costs? It, it does the budget then change? Right. That is, hey, we still have, so under hard costs, there's 13 million, 313,000. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the 313,000 is identified for our energy, renewable energy requirement. And eventually I will probably transfer that to central because we have a 1.5% energy, renewable energy requirement for the bond. Right. We can spend it on one building, two buildings, or some on all. And right now our goal is to get Central and Redmond to lead certified net zero. And they, because they're new buildings, we get the most value out of spending our money there. And so I expect that I will move that money and spend it with our system on Central. The 13 million then that's remaining, that's our budget for construction. The issue with, okay, we're going to have higher escalation inflation because we're a year out. We still have 13 million to spend, but because things cost more, we have to do a few less things. Okay, that, that was my, that yes. was my question yeah. was, is that, that yeah. does not account right. for that. So we will be getting less. Money. Yes, the because thing. there's no other money to increase. Right. Therefore, we have to spend our money differently. Now, I will say, you know, we're seeing inflation. We're seeing escalation. We've seen escalation in the construction industry. The last you know four to five years it spiked about nine months to a year ago it really spiked up a little bit higher but recently we are starting to see trends of uh, uh, cost reductions and this is at a very high level at the moment uh, so some big uh, commodities so lumber which is a huge commodity it fluctuates up and down like no time. Mm -hmm. Steel has been rising, but recently it is 
like hit a peak and it's starting to come down. And that's a really big indicator. Uh, concrete, cost of cement is another big one. And it has also took a dip this past quarter. So we get quarterly reports from the industry of what's going on. You know, in what steel that affects so many trades. We think of structural steel, but it's piping, it's the metals that go into just about everything. Mm -hmm. So there is something that we look and we may find out, hey, that in a year or two, we may see a flattening or a reduction. Uh, I think it's going to be hard for it to keep going up just in the construction industry because it's been rising so much. Right. So we'll monitor that. We may see, hey, we have better buying power than we were anticipating today with that 13 million. And so when we're ready to commence that phase, we will engage in a scoping of, we get an initial concept of what we would do in that building. We're gonna reevaluate that, rebudget it and say, okay, what can we truly afford? What do we need to do? Is there some things that have to be done with the conversion of the building and expand it and then really look at how best we spend on it? Okay. So, sorry, long-winded answer. No, no, no. That's yeah, no. I because that's that's always my concern yes. is that as things, all these delays push things further out. In yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. I noticed on your central library points, the projection cost costs are going down. Yes. How is that happening? Pardon? How is that happening? Construction costs on the Jews and the Well, $10 million is right. It's easy. No. So we had 92 million was where we were roughly, right? right? Previously, and that was for the global building. So how do we bring that down? One big chunk that came out of there and really is now in the land purchase price was the cost of building all of the streets and the public improvements. That was about three and a half, almost $3.6 million worth of uh, construction costs and about a million dollars in fees that we would have been paying to ODOT. So that re help to bring that down because it is in the land cost. The other is, okay, now we have less money. So I got to the 82 million, but I'm saying, okay, what do we need? What do we have to spend on the building? We've got to pay for the land. We've got to pay our design costs, the impact costs, right, if we change. And so then I look and say, okay, what's that leaving? <clears throat> so and that's how I got to the 82 million. And I there's I look at all of the aspects of it. So I looked at it and said, okay, we're reducing our scope of work. That's helping to bring it down. The other is we have to look at how do we design a building that costs less money? One of the ways is we reduce square footage. So we talked about that earlier. We were at 112,000 square feet on the last global design. So by reducing building square footage or area, that's going to be a reduction in cost. That's not the only, you can't uh, accomplish a goal by simply doing that. So then you have to look at, and Matt mentioned, and I mentioned the target value design, and it's a process that we use to say, okay, we've got 82 million, and we want to spend X percent on building structure. And so we had a structural design on the global side that had a cost, a cost total and a cost per square foot based on the type of structural system that we were using. Uh, we had a lot of structural concrete retaining walls because the building was notched into the hillside. We won't have those retaining walls anymore because we're not going to be notched into a hillside. 
And so that's going to reduce cost. There's a lot of ways you can build a building. And the structural frame, and this is, I don't want to get too overwhelming on this, but just the type, the way you engineer and design the structural system. That's one of the areas that we will really look at hard for reducing costs. And this is something that Kirby will be highly engaged in. What's a more cost effective? We looked at, we tried to minimize the amount of columns inside the building to create free air, wide open spaces. Uh, that's more expensive. So we're looking at, okay, how do we introduce columns and reduce our structure by having columns that is more cost-effective to transfer that way? Uh, so that's part of how we look at, how do we reduce it down to, so the 82 million is set on, that's what our budget is. That's how much money we have. Now we have to design our building to that project. It's reduction of the scope, the streets and that it's reduction of the size of the building once we determine it is reevaluating our building design structure design, and what's the best system there to use for lower cost. We had on the rural site we had exposed roof areas that we had green roofs on and big patio out on one end. We will not have those in this new building. That in part is a cost savings. There's probably upwards of a million dollars when you add in all those elements into that. But you know how the building previously was cantilevered? It, it's, that drove cost by making it stacked much more, makes the structural system uh, more efficient, more cost effective. It also makes the skin, the exterior of the building, is it had a lot of skin, square foot of skin there was uh, higher on that building because of the way it was angled than if we stacked it. So that's another we'll look at is to reduce the cost of our skin. Uh, and there's many skins that you can put on buildings and be very efficient skins, skins that are going to meet our goals for energy, for lead, and those things. Beauty, architecture, and building, but be more cost effective. And so that will help us bring down that cost. There's some things that we talked about that we said these are sacred. We don't want you to reduce these elements. We still want to lead certification. We still want to go net zero. We still want to go an all electric system, not use fossil fuels. Uh, you know, some of those core things that we talked about, we haven't raised access for. It gives the library super flexibility to move things in the future, move shelving and stuff. Okay? It's a very efficient system for the library. We said, we don't want to lose that. Uh, we want to solve our problem and we don't want to lose the program. We don't want to lose what we're giving to the public. It's going to change, but we try to minimize any impact on that. So that's how we go about getting delivering the building that's expected within that within this budget. Hopefully, I that address you, right? But I know I pontificated a bit. Yeah. But I noticed that the site can be really this increased by 90. Correct. That's the land purchase. That's the land. Yes. The land is 10 point. It was, but we also back out the 1.3 that was spent on roll uh -huh. because that now, because we can't have that land in our bond because right. we're not building a library on it today. So those funds, that cost is being transferred back to, uh, and I'll say general fund, but mm -hmm. Robert is the it's general. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, so that actually comes out of the bond and whatever you choose to do with global, uh, 
is really not related to the bond. But there's 1.3 million for the back of the general fund. Correct. With, with and then the general fund. Well, it act, technically, it went to the reserve fund. So the reserve fund, it, and that was was part of the adopted budget for this fiscal year. Right. The reserve fund is the right. fund right. Where, right. that that is that is um, accounting for the purchase of that land to be spent, right. rather than right. bond fund money. Because the bond fund money will get restricted to only the construction price. So our budget actually shows transfer to reserve fund. The, the fiscal year 22 to 23 is going to show. Going to show. Yeah, we, we, we haven't we have not yet posted it. That would be the way to do that. that. That's going to take a motion. Uh, it should not take a motion. Reserve. No, we, because it was adopted by the board as part of the budget. The reason that we did that as a supplemental budget uh, a year ago was because the board had not adopted the budget. To transfer the money from the bond fund to reserves so that the bond fund is purchasing the overall so it's never done. It, it had never been done, so we needed to do the, the, uh, the supplemental budget to cover it. But, but now, anticipating that this was likely to happen, we built that into the fund 300 reserve fund budget as a capital outlay. Well, that 1645 is a combination of the the, uh, the the land the land purchase transfer so it's just a bookkeeping expenditure plus additional for uh, for the mobile library okay. remember there's a tax under that we talked about it by the time about transfer of the land to the library right so it's not going to be the same thing as the uh, okay. And 10,000 materials and services. Yeah. And the rest of the 250,000 is the mobile asset. Soft costs? Yes. Are they all architectural? Uh, no. So, soft costs uh, are architectural fees, permits, and plan check fees. Uh, systems development charges. There are more fees than the city, city SDCs, uh, and then all of the miscellaneous consultants. So uh, testing, inspection consultants, or commissioning agent, uh, a number of those soils engineers, those kinds of people. Uh, that's, that is a lot. Of them. Yes. Out of that, how much do you think is that total cost of the software? Um, uh, uh, probably. Good. Well, no, permits and fees is a very high percentage. Uh -huh. It's as much as, if not more than architectural fees. I was just looking to see. The question is, right now, can we break the salt cost down into the architectural fees and then all the other fees? They're about 7%. Is what's all plus? Um, I think I, my calculation is of total. Well, about the salt, that yeah. Here that the salt costs themselves are only 25 to 100 percent of total costs. Yeah, so when you look at it, the total salt costs are 21 million for work, 100,000. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from central. yeah, from central. And the architect's portion of that is, uh, and this includes my forecast on the other test, is uh, 9 million seven. So it's about 40%, 45% of the total is what it is. I think for, for uh, tracking and counting. We do it in a much a higher right. detail level of of that. So it wouldn't take much to put it in here. It I just feel comfortable knowing how much we pay the office tax. Yeah. It I can. It maybe I just gotta work my formulas uh, to do it. 
Is there anybody else that needs that level of detail? Someone in the room is thinking about 40% of the software. What are the assignments? Yes, you know, the report is our summary report, and it breaks it down into what are really kind of standardized categories. These are subtotals right out of in our budget report. Each of these are a subtotal mm -hmm. category. So hard costs, soft costs, lane are standard categories. But we take each of those categories and break it down into multiple vendors, multiple cost codes, and then separately we have actual, we break those into their actual contracts. So it's just a matter of what's in this room that I submit to you guys. It's just, this is a Kind of a standardized report that we issue with our monthly reports normally. Uh, when I, as I work with Robert, uh, we go through every last little bit of detail within our budget uh, so that he can always see what we're spending, how we're spending it down to the penny. I don't know that about how the category itself is also 30% of the I think that it was like five percent of the soft costs. It's but it's actually it's very normal. But when you look at it, it's seven percent of the development cost. And that's very much within normally you're looking at a range, uh, depending on size of projects for that, uh, about six and a half percent up to 10% for eight architects and engineer fees. We're actually on the lower end because it's a larger project. If on small projects, it could be up as high as 10%. But so it's not abnormal. As far as being a large component of soft costs, it, it is normal that much, that percentage. And, and I will only say that, that one of the things that I'm looking for when Greg and I concur is um, within the bounds of the approved um, uh, contract amount that the board has already reviewed with Greg and said, yep, I'm authorized to, to work with Miller Hall up to this amount. I'm tracking what's their what's their spend rate within the the, the total limits of the contract because there's a certain project life cycle. You don't expect it to be a straight line spend. You expect there to be a decent amount of upfront work from your from your architect or firm, and then there then once you get past plan check, then there's, you expect there to be taper off to a certain extent, uh, and as the involvement uh, drifts back, and then CMBC kind of steps in. Uh, it doesn't go to zero by any means either. But but what we're looking for is. We're, we're, what I'm looking for is seeing that that the spend rate conforms to an expected uh, curve, and that overall that that's going to land within the the, the, the contract budget. If we and if, if there's ever a situation where it looks like we're exceeding where where benchmarks say we should be, Greg and I have conversations. We've seen it a couple times with some of the other soft cost fees, things like our. Ironically enough, our cost consultant. So our cost consultant um, tracked a little bit ahead of my benchmarks. We sat down and talked through it, and and after Greg went through the details of that, it seemed like that that still was reasonable. Yeah, I love that the contraction as well. Yeah, for the cost, you know, is there any reason why the board should not have? Is it seems to be a lot. It seems to be a lot. It, it's only if you, what you guys want to see. I can craft that report to say what you want. Uh, because it's it's going to say soft cost, but we're going to break out architects. It'd be soft cost without architects fees and then architects fees. Uh, yeah, it's I a mean, matter if that's what you want. Does anybody else want that level of detail on this? It's quite me by her him. 
I know. I mean, I, to me, that's not that's necessary. Uh, it's because partly because we have oversight of approving these contracts, so we know what we approve when we approve it. I would also offer that that there is an opportunity for any of the board members who are in the warrant signing for that particular month um, when we pay the year of tax meeting. The, the warrant signer has a has a chance to identify that as one of their spot checks and say, I want to see down to the cent. What did we pay the architects and how did that bring up uh, break out across each of the projects? Right. So there is that level of visibility right now. Um, yeah. I'm not questioning veracity of how you're accounting for it. I'm assuming it's going to go as well. And also, I guess I have a very nice topic that would be scoreless. You double check and do it. And you say, as a board member, if 40% of the soft costs are down to the budget, I can look up the one that you actually don't want there so much on this basis. Everything else in soft costs would be just easy purpose. I don't think it's just a lot of time. I think it's just a lot of time. Most of those are just a lot of time. All you need is great soft costs and say, here's soft costs, everything else is up to your feet. You don't have to just sit on some time. Well, I think the question is that if we, rather than the board needs to have the board direct on what they want, that's all. I'm not saying one way or another, but it should be. Yeah, and I think we have a consensus that we don't need that level of detail. But if you'd like to make a motion, you can vote on that. Oh, okay. Great. Would it be helpful for you to see that like in the quarterly versus? Well, I, would I would say if I did see that, I would just put it in the report. I would say if I did it, I would just. Set the report up to do it. I just have to okay. go in and do that. Okay. Your the report you did. I don't do any data entry into it. It reads my main report. I it's really up to you what you want to see, and I can how many, adjust. How many people would like our to be How many people don't need that? Could could Ray meet with you? And then we can get more than you said. I just want to do it. It should be. It should be as the board 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 as no, our fee is now. a fixed fee, so if it's something that you guys yeah, and want, we have, I can do it. I understand that you're willing, but I don't, I, we had a vote here and I think. If there's no other questions on the report, there are the two items that uh, issued the summary. So one is the Redmond Fire Sprinkler Award. So this is the fire sprinkler system is, is a design build system. And we determined that we want to bring that sub design build subcontractor on board now to work with our design team as they're finishing their construction documents to develop the fire sprinkler plan. And so Kirby developed an RFP, went out, got proposals, and bids back from uh, subcontractors, recommended the um, low bid subcontractor on that. Um, we were all in agreement that, that they're qualified and capable of doing it. what's in front of you. And so I, I wrote up that summary of what we did. What we need is authorization for Todd to sign the change order or contract amendment to add this scope of work into Kirby's contract. And so that's the one that's titled Redmond Fire Sprinkler Award. So that's kind of my quick summary. <laughs> but the, uh, and I, 
wrote at the very bottom of it basically what that authorization is. Any questions right on this? How did I get into the meeting? I need to authorize the library director to sign the code to $226,600. $226,600 for the Bedford Library to buy a screen share site. Further discussion? In favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. The second one is the one that's entitled Sisters Temporary Trailer. And this is with uh, SunWest Builders. So we determine for our temporary facilities, we are going to rent a modular trailer. It's a double wide, it will be placed right on the side on library land there and one of the reasons we're asking to do this now is we need to order the trailers because of lead time on getting it so we can get it get it set up and ready to go for January. We had SunWest put together a cost estimate so it'll be under their contract for them to rent it, get it, get it set up. They have budgets in this number two do temporary water, temporary power, connect us to the sewer and those things. Um, so this allows them money funds in their contract to engage those different uh, vendors in order to set it up. The trailer will actually not get installed until um, probably in December, but we gotta get it ordered and then they will actually uh, get it built to our respect. So of how we want it laid out. So again, the request is for authorization for Todd to sign that uh, contract amendment for the $143,091. This is just, you know, there's a no, no, it's the trailer and its facility. So stairs, ramps, connecting the sidewalks, uh, and then like I said, all the temporary utilities. And it sits on the sister's property? Yes. Okay. So that in request for her. Yeah. yeah, we have a budget for uh, moving. So when we are emptying out the library for construction, we're going to be moving stuff out of there. We also have some pieces that are already in storage, shelving and different pieces. So we have a bud separate budget uh, in our development budget. Uh, that will actually be uh, different vendors. We'll have moving companies at that. Any other questions? Okay. They're going to be doing, they're going to be um, having patrons come in and pick up the books. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The library staff has looked at and said, okay, here's what size it is. Here's what we can offer as a temporary service. Uh, a lot of pickups and drop offs, uh, not a lot of uh, stacks to walk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 That's budgeted. It's budgeted within, there's a little bit in here, but in our plan of the renovation of Sisters is in those dollars in the GMP will include the dollars to restore the landscaping after we leave. So one of the things that we have to do is there's a tree that is right where the trailer needs to go. So we'll remove that tree and SunWest is budgeted dollars for that. And then we will replant the tree, uh, a new tree, when we, after the trailer has been removed and we reestablish. Because once we set that trailer on top of that grass, the grass will die right? and we will have to reseed it and grow it back in. So that's fine. 
Uh, it's actually not a very large tree. No. Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah. it's it's a, it's a maple. Yeah. That's not Okay. So it's not yeah, it's part of the, it's part of the, the landscape plan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion. The short version of the story is that. Oh yes, go ahead. I'm I'm so sorry. Yes, of course I can. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the short version of the story is that the last time that the, the purchasing threshold amounts were reviewed and revised was back in 2014. So the board reviewed the the uh, the, the overall purchasing rules in 2020 most recently, but held at the 2014 level. So at this point, we're about eight years in on the, the guidelines and, and, and the standards that we apply for where spending authority lies. So right now, anything up to 10,000 is, is, is allowed for the, the individual car manager to make a purchasing decision. Uh, between 10 and 50,000 in general is set for director's discretion and authority. And anything above 50,000 is at the board's discretion and board authority to authorize that that purchase. And then within that that uh, upper band, then there's some additional steps involved with in terms of whether an informal or a formal RFP process is required. Uh, so looking at the state of uh, inflation, both in terms of material costs, but also in terms of labor costs, uh, we've noticed that many of our vendors have been coming back to us lately with with in cost increase notifications that are far higher than than what we've seen in the most recent past. And, and we started looking at what is that going to mean downstream in the next few years as we move forward with increased labor costs and increased material costs. Um, and looking at more and more of our vendor procurement decisions rising above that $50,000 threshold level. Uh, so, so what that means for the board is that there, we are anticipating there are going to be more and more sections of monthly board meetings devoted to the review and approval of purchasing decisions and, and more of those decisions landing on a monthly cycle, which could potentially have impacts to our ability to, to get a vendor on contract and get work done uh, in, in a timely fashion. Uh, and, and furthermore, we started asking, like, if it's been eight years since we looked at the thresholds, does it make sense for us to take another look at it? We engaged legal counsel on this, asked if there were any particular um, either state or uh, state requirements or, or board bylaws that prevent us from re-examining these thresholds and setting them at, at a place that seems to, to provide a little bit more of that flexibility. Uh, they came back and said nothing restricting it, and then we we went forward with legal counsel to to structure a revision to the procurement rules and uh, and also the the uh, the board policy that that's related to that financial issues that I discussed. Uh, so what I've included in your packet is the proposed uh, revision to the the purchasing authority. Uh, uh, Rules as well as the, the policy on financial conditions and activities. Uh, the, the top level changes are that we essentially 
increased the, uh, the, the amount of authority that the board would delegate to the director from 50,000 to 150,000 for goods and services and, and exempted personal services, things like accounts and, and, and things like that. Um, whereas for um, building construction projects, uh, we, we uh, observed uh, a much more restrictive set of policies that held much more closely to both Oregon regulated statutes, and regulated statutes, as well as as uh, legal counsel's handbooks. Uh, there, there's some other smaller revisions in there. Legal counsel put some notes in there of, of additional internal controls for legal review of, of some of the some of the various uh, uh, types of purchases that we would make at certain levels. But, but the, the, the main thing that we're looking at here is that increase in the director's federal authority from 50 to 150,000, which would give us enough headspace for inflationary growth on some of those mid range vendor services that, that we, we procure all the time that over the course of the next few years may drift into that above 50,000 and, and give us some time to, to adjust and make those adjustments as, as possible. So uh, what is it that I'm asking for today? I'm asking for you to, to review over the, both of those documents, the purchasing rule, uh, I'm sorry, the spending authority uh, rules, as well as the policy 3E, and, and determine whether or not uh, you wish to approve the revision of that piece of it. Can this uh, policy be amended to that's correct. Much like the policy now, it remains in place at the board's pleasure. And if the board wants to reconsider it again, then, then they can bring it up just like we are now and, and approve it at a, a different level. Uh, so, so it could be one of these uh, situations where, where we have this in place for a period of time, like the like previous rules, and either we as the you know, staff take a look at it and say, is this still serving us? Or obviously the board could, could ask that question as well and, and ask us to come back with the changes to the documents. This would also help as in in general. It should it, it should actually hold things as they are for the construction projects. So board the board will still have the level of involvement it has now for those kinds of spending decisions. This is more for the day to day operations. Uh, things things like um, our security service or our um, our courier, uh, where you know mileage cost the cost of fuel has gone up so much for the, the courier drivers that. And, the, and and we don't know where those fluctuations lie. So in any given year, we could be looking at a contract that costs us just over fifty or just under fifty, and then so we, we could be be coming with with odds and ends of contracts throughout the year. Uh, I don't really have a good estimate of how much because it's really dependent on price fluctuation. But we do have on the order of probably about fifty vendors that are in that forty thousand. To to fifty thousand band, uh, between three, three, two and three dozen vendors, and so so those, if there were any price fluctuations that pushed them over, we could be coming back to you with another two or three dozen vendor selections the next time we have to review the contract. Uh, that, that that's really the main thing. So so I think the choices are you could leave policy as is, the potential impact, which at this time is unknown, but but is out there, is that we. We could be having more discussions in the board meetings devoted to to contracts that you know you may look at and say, well, okay, this is this is something that you guys just take care of as a matter of course. Why are we considering it? And that would be fine. I, I will add in that uh, in the past, our attorney's guideline was you passed it in the budget, we were good, and that's why everything under fifty thousand dollars. Call out the budget. Uh, in this last review, she came back and said, No, you had to go out bring four, which again could potentially we could be spending a chunk of it. 
So this is also remember that everything we do is within the spending limits of what's law says. Okay. I couldn't speak to what other libraries do, but certainly within the discussion we have with the legal counsel, uh, every everything that we looked at fell within the range of reasonable and justifiable uh, increases from from a legal, from a legal perspective. So basically, you're taking these categories the more we the lowest category is about the award. That low category where the, there was like an informal RFP? Right. Yes. That's for the uh, exempt personal or yeah, exempt personal yeah. services. No regulated services. Uh, regulated services. Yeah, architects and engineers do fall do, do fall in that that table that did get adjusted. Um, at this time, I do not anticipate that, that we would be adding additional architects or engineers to the to the work. And I, I believe that that um, selection of Miller Hall specifically uh, and other architects and engineers related to the construction project would actually fall under the public improvement solicitations mm -hmm. rather than the regular personal service sites. So it would fall under the rules that would restrict it to uh, uh, library boards or anything that would run under that. Okay. Um, pleasure to the board. I to to delegate spending authority to the board policy three of financial commission. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Did I mislead you? <laughs> okay, I'll do. I move to approve the revisions to delegated spending authority for the policy meeting on financial condition of activities, increasing library director spending authority to the committee. The new discussion. Those in favor? Okay. Um, I yep. I have a to the agenda. It's a bonus item because I shot the number of you. Um, <laughs> so, this is uh, share me enough. This is the resolution we passed in June. Um, we filed it with the county, and um, they requested that we add this one box at the bottom that shows, and I will. Uh, uh, they just wanted the amount that they're putting into the bond funding for taxes in there as excluded from limitation. Excluded from limitation means it's excluded from measure 50 limitations um, uh, that, that cap. Uh, taxation because it's bond um, So this is no change anything we've done. It's just I thought rather because this is something we voted on, uh, just to be extra safe, we should revote because I'm changing law. Any, any questions on that? Okay. Okay. I'll make a comment to approve the revised budget resolution. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 A
I have one thing I just want to highlight for you. Um, all right, here we go. Um, just remind you that you're all elected officials, um, and you all represent specific zones or are kind of broken up into five zones. And um, what we do is that we take all the precincts within the Shoes County and we divide our, our goal is to divide them up as evenly as possible as the state law. And so this is what it looks like currently. That changes every 10 years after the census comes out. And it, and that always happens. So the 2020 census members just came out in 2022. And I'm just, we will need to look at this and reallocate uh, because the population changes. So I just want to uh, forecast what we'll be looking at. I actually went through and looked at these and we're not that far off from the numbers. Um, you know, Ray and Ann, I remember this was a complicated process 10 years ago. Um, I've actually looked at a couple of scenarios where we could move uh, two of the precincts in the um, So I just want to forecast that and then check in with you as to how we might want to have that discussion. Um, I'm thinking one thing I could do is just bring you a couple of scenarios to balance it out and you can look at it that way. Um, but I don't foresee major changes. Uh, I actually was putting this off for the last three months because I thought it would be really complicated. Um, so that's something to uh, be aware of. If you need any more information on that, I'm happy to talk about it because it's kind of it's a very nerdy fun thing to talk about. Um, but this can be, do people have feelings about yeah, this as okay. far as how you like to proceed? Okay, then we can go. Yes. And then it's forward. Yeah, because this is super complicated. So I can't get it. Wait, that's starting. Um, no, he was, he said by December, he said most helpful is if we did it this summer so that if just in case there were any issues, we could correct them before I feel like that would improve the cooperation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It doesn't matter, it's a sensitive topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is there. Uh, I don't have any other major news for you, except for um, we're very much in the middle of our summer flight, or you've heard about that already. So I will spare you one. We love summer flight. <laughs> uh, for foundation news, I don't have a lot of news there. For members, I want to So our next item on the end is critical communication. So, and I'm not, because this is new, I'm not quite sure what we do with this, but it is. Well, this is part of the outgrowth of our work with Margo. It's a, it's just a, a spot for us to reflect. We just had this meeting and were there any aspects of this meeting that we feel um, we, we might want to highlight. Set up a press release or put out information on the website based on the um, and I put this as a standing agenda. Right. So I, didn't just, I didn't have a specific communication from this community. Do you think there's any basis for that? A whole of us. So, something that came up during the weekend that we didn't about, 
Well, no, not necessarily that we're concerned about it, but we feel like it needs to be communicated to the public. You can turn to the website or you. You made a decision uh, that we are going to do away with the books of the library. I would say that's probably a critical communication. I'm sorry, I simplified that. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to think of some of the ones. Uh, I'm sure we will have people interested in our youth in discussion. Right. Because it was promoted as we are about to shut down. Kind of, based on the emails I've been looking at during this meeting, a lot of people interpreted all of these articles. We were about to shut it down. Um, so, uh, so that's that might be a critical communication for us. It's just that we have not made any major decisions on that, and we still have to use through the Right. Our discussion that we had earlier just about why why we're where we are and where we each want to go to to come back to sort of the issues and summarize that as a summarize. I think I want to have to do the I'm just from the discussion we had with Mario. I think we were talking about different outlets, outward communication. You don't have to have a third. Yeah, right. It is not required. Yeah, no, but I think I think communication is good that we're committed to continued service in East East Bend and that we're decision on that facility and 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 it's it's not a good Okay, so self-review of the meeting. I think we've discussed in open session why we're pursuing the central library concept, which requires a larger piece of property. And, and you know, part, part of this is the integrity as a public entity and as an organization that. We've entered into a letter of intent with seller, and I think we have to honor that letter of intent as far as fully investigating the property that we just chose. 
Um, so the fact that someone else is coming forward and, and offering an alternative, we've entered into a, a we've stated our intent. We did it with all. And and we and and the thing is is that Todd has met with the bulletin. Uh, Todd and Chuck Hall spent well over more than an hour with the reporter after our last meeting, answering all of her questions. So I mean, I feel like we've provided, we've answered every question that's been asked of us by the bulletin. And the fact that they are writing editorials um, asking, saying that we need to provide information when we provided all the information we can ask. And, and They've been party to the executive sessions where we did go through and fully discuss each of the topics on that list. Or heard, heard pros and cons on each. And we, we had full discussions. And yeah, those were not in open session because they're property purchases. And there's a reason why property purchases are discussed in closed session. But as far as being open, I think we've been very transparent. So I, I feel like we've always been willing to provide the public with anything in the past. And the other bullet is going back to the same word. That's not a lot. Well, that, that's. I, 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 my, my two cents is because I did sit down with the uh, uh, bulletin on Tuesday. Um, they, I, I got what they were saying in the editorial. It's uh, whether we came back and said, here's the exact location of the private street property, I think what they're getting at is in public session, we could do more to say, here's, here's we look at these properties in South Bend, and here's where you can fly. Not by the top of my list, these properties in North Bend, these are the right time. And so that's a good learning opportunity for us. I think that's good feedback for us when we do come out of the executive session, uh, especially because in the past, uh, nobody's ever been here. <laughs> so it was natural for us to come out and just make a decision. Um, so, but I think it's, it's right for us to start thinking. I don't know when we have our next executive session. Uh, but to know that when we come out of that, we do need to get more information. Here's what. Yeah, and as a former journalist, I mean, I believe that it's incumbent on journalists to ask those questions. And if they have those, if they have questions, we've never not answered their questions. So if they have questions and they want to know, We'll tell them why. And I mean, it's uh, like Todd said, I mean, I think it is a good, good point to keep in mind and to remember that we need to do that. But um, today's and this morning's discussion is a very good example of being very transparent. Right. So, yeah, which is the question? So, when we, if we do decide on then will that be an executive session or will it be? I mean, when That's we make a final decision and say, yes, we're doing this and we're ready to sign on. Yeah, there may be some part, I'd have to okay, I check. Just, there may be some part of that that would be executive session, but I think it would be very limited because we're basically just having to move forward or not. Mm -hmm. um, I don't Think and I have to check the question. I don't think we're doing anything that's going to be in the same as well. Right. Just as you were saying, uh, we did yeah. we come out of that and say this was our decision for this time, and this is what we found through our due diligence. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. More scientific. Yeah. Right. And our responses. Yeah. And so the piece of property that was this portfolio for today was not the one that we agree with the market. My recommendation would be that we we have just entered into a contract with thank you, letter of intent, moving forward to the purchase and sale agreement. Does not commit us to make that point. If we do a letter of intent, it's not a full point for you to do it. It's not a contract. Right? To our realtor and said, Do you want to talk? Um, and their answer was, One, now it's uh, fine. He said, No, I wasn't listed for sale when we did this process. Uh, the second one was their certain level of zoning, and also it doesn't meet our, I can tell you what it said, but basically, they're their information back to me was this, this really didn't sound like it met any of our our um, requirements. Um, no, the size was seven twelve. That's the criteria that we had. I think this property, I remember, they said it was between five and six acres. Inside, so I think it is a little bit on the smaller side. Mm -hmm. um, it still has, to, while the city did an area plan for that, it still has to go through the annexation uh, process, which was something that we said, let's find land that's already annexed into the city. Uh, so that, and I know Todd's looking it up, but I believe that. What I've heard was their current zoning was uh, not compatible. That's correct. And that it would need to be actually rezoned as part of an action that we would have to take with the city. Um, with the city and which is, you may or may not get it. There's no guarantee, as we know. Um, so, first blushes. It's really not meeting our criteria um, to uh, consider based on that, uh, based on its size and its location. I think the thing about the eastern property that did make it somewhat was that it was on not, but it's also on 15. It was at a roundabout. Mm -hmm. This is now down at the end, right where you 
it's that piece of property that goes from the end of the east end up the hill right there. Um, I don't think it's going to have the type of presence, even if it was a large enough lot, because I believe it's not a lot of frontage, but depth. So, you know, just the way it sits there, uh, I don't think that lot is going to be large enough for the central library. And I think it would be a little bit more challenging on access when you compare it to all of the other properties that we did consider. I would take Eastman by far over this one because of its on the round and it's much more connected. I think this pushes it further. I think personally, Stevens Ranch was a much better option uh, because of its location okay. and many reasons. That's why we yeah. didn't recommend it. No. But it was considered. I mean, no. Was no. Time no. 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 It was an email that came in last week. I think they're talking about Easton now. Easton was considered and many review for oh, pros and cons. We'll leave through that whole that whole uh, yeah. analysis with the with the pit check. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only right. reason Easton got it. Said you looked at it, something wrong. Right. No, no, no. But funny. that was literally from the email that came in last week. Bob shared it with me and with Compass and said, Did you know okay. about this piece of property? You're okay. From uh, that, I surmised. Okay. I just made my assessment. All I asked, okay. uh, I asked them was, Did we look at the property? Uh, because uh, Kristen Brown said, Why didn't you look at the property? Uh, and the response to me was this property was never on our radar, so as far as I know, it's not for sale. But more importantly, it is on UA, uh, which is considered farmland. Uh, it does not look like any annexation or magic planning process that's are underway. So, there we go. so I, that, I, that, that's a six acre area. I'm just saying where we are, but I think the previous comments we had about the fact that we've done our work. With Identify land, and we are actively pursuing one. This may come up. We may have three other people on the next right. come back and say, "I've got a property." Uh, matter of fact, I got one yesterday from. That's not you. You did uh, from the realtor that sold us the north property, looking trying to sell. Well, actually, I have to do one in Um Trying to sell property. Yeah. Uh, actually. Lease it. Oh, lease they it. don't want to sell it. They want, <laughs> it. want right. the library to lease the land. No, I just want to be I may get but more emails like that. But at this point, unless the board changes direction or wants to look at a different property, uh, don't. Yes. Right. That's a critical communication. Point, I would suggest my advice to the board is do what you've been doing, which is continue to do um, the work you've done, which is your research, the investigation, talking to experts. Um, and I think that these work is in there. That's how you explain it. All the down. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, I said everyone did something like that. It was That's going to be up to the community to find out. Yes, we're going to do a press release about that. Mm -hmm. 
But if we were, I right, that's what I'm trying to go back to the bulletin of editorial. I have not heard from any of you outside of the executive session of your standing. So I would need your approval to or get your feedback about why we would chose what we chose. I guess I'm confused. But, uh, we did it not go out and we talked to the whole team about the Stevens language. And I think it was a point about it's a good piece of property that it would be easy to spend. And they got, they got all of that. Their editorial is saying they want to know why we didn't shoot the other product. Okay. I'm happy with the fact that the bulletin knows why why we chose the talk and shows in this company to talk to Mike about it and that the board is satisfied with the company's this is kind of radical. Yeah. How far down did you go? And I am. That's something that we certainly do. But I'm not sure that I mean, then what's the next request? What's the next request? I mean, I think. And that makes the, that that makes me sound like I don't want to provide the information, and I don't think that that's true at all. I want the public to know that we look at an extensive list of property, and that we that we as a board chose what we believe to be the best, the property with the best attributes, the wisest, and that's just like. Any public entity going forward. And I mean, I, I don't see the bulletin exercising this same level of scrutiny when the school district buys the, a site for a, a, a new grade school or when the parks district acquires lands for a new park. We're a public entity and, and we've got constraints on finances to try to find the best possible land to serve the public, just like these other agencies do. And no one is asking them why they're choosing the land that they're choosing. You know, they're choosing the best possible land that's available, which is what we get. Um, so yeah, we can go back through the realtor's presentation and say, yes, we agree with the realtor that this was not a viable option, but we can say we know from experience that this was not a viable option. These are the criteria we used. And yeah, we can do that if the board wants to go there. Um, I still believe we went there, we go there on the fly. It would just, it would, it would be a snowball. My recommendation is that's good feedback from the board and that's what we should commit to and as we can go forward. And, right, yeah. I and just one my feeling is this is the person's job that, as you said, if they come and ask the questions, you answer them. I'm not positive that it's our responsibility to go to the bulletin and tell them what we want them to know. It's their responsibility to come and find out, isn't it? Again, I think what their main point was talk more about what you are in public session. Yeah. So. Okay. I'm looking at everybody's face. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. We want to do self review of the meeting. Okay. <laughs> and and got to the, the self review. Oh, starting with the yeah. end. You're at the end, so I thought it was the end. <laughs> uh, I read some points down here that, um, one, I want to thank Lori on 
I also appreciate that Emily and Robert um, are striving so hard to make sure that this new system is up and running for the opening of the world's balance box. And uh, I also appreciate the community and the process of the issues of the world dog of the argument to her business. And I would appreciate the approach. Are there any allocations to purposes? I don't know. And I'm going to spring in. Thank you. Ray? Go ahead. I was meant to see my experience with one of the other kids. Thank you, Robert. Just say, we talk to Catherine. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. I mean, I second everything that Wendy said as well. One of the things in going through the list of the organizations that are a little bit of the you know, um, I was really so pleased to see, and actually I saw it in person when the van comes to the homeless areas. And so we have a pop-up kitchen that I cook for in Redmond. So when they came, I just, I don't know, that just made me feel really good to see that. I just want to reiterate, I appreciate it having um, people involved in our community partnerships with uh, Ring Zone, especially Ring Zone from the community. So, you know, we appreciate it. Yeah, that was, that was your right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, that was this presentation. Really I just think. Those partnerships really expand what we can do in the community, and it also expands what our partners can do in the community as well as the community synergy. Yeah. Well, I should have, there's one last thing. We are trying to schedule, we were talking before about trying to schedule two separate board meetings, and that's it's getting very difficult to do that, just with all of your schedules and vacations. Um, I just wanted to do a check in with you that I know it's a long day, but when we have these longer sessions, if you get in one day, I publish the schedule, but I just want to check in. It's a bad time to ask you when you're on um, But that's what I'm looking at, looking at Lori and looking at schedules. We're just running up against a brick wall trying to find a second for them. Um, so I just wanted to check in on, on that as far as if you were seeing a larger agenda and spending the week for just the one day. I almost I don't do that. That would be in the year. Sorry, I think we're functioning better in two days. So we're not tired, and we're not missing other people. Thank you.